Well, I, I've always been a bit embarrassed as as, as being thought of as, as the person who introduced the flute to rock music, and I, I'm always quick to point out there were others doing it before I, I got there. Notably, Ray Thomas of the Moody Blues, I think Chris Wood of Traffic. Um, around the time I started, there was a Dutch band called Focus who had a burst of fluty uh, um, favour in the charts. Um, so, I mean, I wasn't the only one. Even, even, even Peter Gabriel of Genesis I saw recently on some old bit of film footage is at least posing with a flute. I don't know if he actually played the damn thing, but he, you know, he's certainly waving it around a bit. So, you know, there, it, was, it was not unheard of. But I knew of it really more of a music in the, con in the context of folk music, is, is what flute meant to me, and, and classical music. And, and the idea of bringing it into a, a more rock music context was, um, was really not so much as, an, uh, as, as having been influenced by, by the flute players in the world of pop and rock music, but really more by, by being a failed guitar player. I mean, I took up the flute because I realized very early on I was never going to be an Eric Clapton or the Eric Clapton, because when I heard Eric Clapton in probably late 66, early 77, I mean, that was 67, that's when I, I knew that, I mean, he was just so far ahead of everybody else, it seemed, that struggling along trying to play the bluesy guitar stuff I was doing, it, it, it just seemed better to find something else to play. So, I mean, I said about it, really, because Eric Clapton didn't play the flute, and then quickly I realized neither did Jimi Hendrix or Jimmy Page or Jeff Beck, and I was kind of out there on my own using the flute in, in that more aggressive surrogate guitar way. It, I, I don't think there was a problem for me playing... Um, it's always been a difficult instrument to integrate into rock music because it's an acoustic instrument, it's not easy to amplify, and you just basically have to play it as loudly as you can into a microphone. And I you know, developed this, the singing technique that, that it's an age-old age old, uh, um, appendage to players of jazz music, blues music, scat singing, you know, as a guitar player when I was 15 or 16, I used to play solos and did he bit better to sing along with them and, you know, Mose Allison would be there, kind of just mumbling <laughs> tunelessly to, along with his piano playing. It's as, a, it's as old as the hills, that scat singing thing, and, and obviously Roland Kirk brought it to a, a level of prominence with the flute, but it, it was a no option <laughs> for me because in order to match up with the guitar, I had to reinforce the flute notes with that, that vocalizing that was, you know, gave it the aggressive quality that the pure flute tone doesn't. But I was always a great admirer of people who could play nicely because I couldn't. I, I could only play the way I played in sort of monophonic riffs and aggressive solos. I couldn't really play very nicely. And so, I mean, I, I've, always, uh, I've always rather envied the, the flute solo in Nights in White Satin. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a little disappointed that there have been, in pop and rock music, the, the, the flute has been used quite a lot in the 60s and into the 70s, and, and obviously not just by me. But whilst it's occasionally just sort of slipped in, you know, as a little bit of a buzzy noise or a, a little decorative thing or a crossover people like James Galway and Annie's song and that sort of stuff, it's not really been taken up as an instrument by, as a, as a lead instrument, as a really forthright main part of a group, really by anybody, I wouldn't say anybody at all, but anybody that I've come across. And I'm, it is really, really surprising. It is a difficult instrument to fit in. But there must be a lot of people out there who think, you know, Ian Anderson bloke must have met a pilot dosh playing the flute. You know, maybe I'd give that a try. You know, for perhaps not dissimilar reasons to, to why I started playing. That, they weren't very good guitar players or keyboard players or they, they couldn't work out how to work their shiny new Ac Apple Mac and the computer programs to do sort of dinky donkey music. They might you'd think someone would give it a go. It's not a difficult instrument to play. Difficult though to integrate it and give it a meaningful role in, in, in contemporary rock music. But you know, it would it would work beautifully well in in Coldplay's music. You know, I mean I, it's a perfect sort of choice for so many bands, but but and I guess if Coldplay had a flute player, they would stand out from the crowds in, in, you know, in, a, in, a, in a bigger way than they already do. It's, it's a great instrument to sort of make you a little different to everybody else, but um, surprising, no, no one's come along. And, uh, and with Ray Thomas you know, disappearing from the Moody's at any rate, then um, there's one less of us than, than there used to be, <laughs> which kind of leaves me and not too many others that anybody's ever heard of. And, um, Nice, nice to be a, a big 
fish in a small pool, but but sometimes, you know, you can swimming around can get a little lonely when you don't feel there's a young pretender coming along to make you, uh, you know, make you work a bit harder or teach you teach practice. you some new tricks. <laughs> I was going to say also, I mean, the the fact is that both bands have had a fantastic career over nearly four, four decades now. What do you think is the secret of the longevity of Moody Blues and, and Jeff Lintel? Why have these bands lasted so long and remain important? I think in the case of the Moody Blues, it, it's, it's having a bunch of really good songs that people people don't necessarily know that they know until they hear them. Then they think, "Oh, I remember that one too." And I, I, I bought a, a, a you know kind of double album, best of the Moody Blues kind of thing, um, and um, and I thought well, I knew one or two songs. But then when I listened to it, I kept hearing these other ones that. I remember that one as well, and it all adds up to this sort of body of work, which is um, what I think is is behind the the weight and authority that bands like the Moody Blues have in in in, the, in popular opinion to this day. Because when you're replacing a flute player, in a, where do you find a rock and roll flute player? There's one. It's probably going to be on this series, isn't there? That everybody knows. And funnily enough, I did meet Ian Anderson uh, only recently. I've known him for years, but we met again recently in Germany last year. I think it was, was it the 50 years of rock and roll, big, big TV show in Germany, kind of three-hour special covering the whole, the whole deal from Bill Haley and the Comets to the Rasmus or whatever was current at the time and on the show. And, um, and I discovered the Moody Blues were on and... Uh, and uh, I knew that Ray Thomas, flute player, had left, so I thought, this is my big chance. I'll, you know, if I ask nicely, maybe they'll let me play, the, you know, I'll get to play flute in Nights, uh, Nights and White Sassen, because I figured that's the one they would do, which of course they did. But my heart fell when I saw that uh, standing next to Justin Hayward, there was uh, uh, a rather attractive young lady flute player who'd been uh, enlisted after the demise of Ray Thomas. So, um, so I have still no chance. He came up to me in the corridor with this thing. He says, why didn't you ask me when Ray left? And I said, well, it's just the solo, you know. He said, I've always wanted to do that solo. So um, whether he meant it or not, I don't know.